Welcome to the Startup Grind. Welcome to our sixth uh, Startup Grind uh, edition. So, um, summer, it's, we have lovely weather, we have uh, the soccer game, we have many new uh, also uh, participants, uh, but also some Stammgäste, uh, which, is, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, let me qu uh, quickly introduce to start up, uh, you to Startup Grind or tell you some, give you some background information uh, about who we are. Uh, because some of you are here for the first time. So Startup Grind, we started last year uh, mm, here in November. Startup Grind is an international family. We are uh, represented in like about 200 cities across the world, founded in Silicon Valley, it's spread all over the world, and we started, as I said, in autumn last year with the chapter here in Frankfurt. So what, what is the aim? As you see here, uh, the two uh, uh, chairs, uh, we have a fire set side chat uh, um, uh, with the interesting people, founders, CEOs, uh, today first time experience with an investor, uh, and we will bring you the decision makers, uh, also an, uh, interesting people, uh, to give you inspiring new ideas uh, of what they do and who they are, so we are understand ourselves as uh, community builders. Uh, both here in our regional ecosystem, but also uh, linking to the global uh, trends. Uh, uh, a team member uh, of Startup Grind and myself went to London to the Startup Grind uh, Europe conference four weeks ago. We met there uh, a lot of lovely people, startups, like big startups, like Google, for example. Uh, so Alphabet's uh, uh, chairman, uh, Eric Schmidt, was there. Uh, uh, Shazam was there, 500 startups, so all the big uh, names in the in the. Uh, uh, ecosystem. It, it is good to have interaction, and we try to, you know, spread out the world and uh, be the voice for Frankfurt and the right mind region. So whenever you know you need support, if you want to have an international rollout, or like Corina, want to go to the valley and meet lovely people, we try to help you uh, connecting you with uh, interesting uh, startups. Now, uh, without further ado, uh, our uh, guest, um, I think uh, most of you know him, Jens Munk, uh, is an uh, uh, investor. Uh, he's been in the uh, investment uh, spectrum uh, for like many, many years. He has a, a, a experience over 25 years with technologies. He has founded a successful companies himself, started then uh, uh, investing into companies, did uh, exciting M&A projects, uh, advised uh, companies in their growth strategies, and also brought companies uh, to, uh, or, or contributed to their exit, uh, and also um, advised in, in IPOs uh, at NASDAQ and uh, other very exciting projects. Some of the companies were acquired by uh, companies like Amazon on, or, or AOL. Uh, and he's been in this uh, yeah, field for, as I said, many years. He is uh, of Danish origin, but has been living here for many years in Frankfurt. So he is one, he is a Frankfurter group. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I think he will uh, um, tell uh, us more about uh, uh, his uh, activities, his investment activities, and give maybe also some startups interesting ideas. So you have also the opportunity to ask him questions. We have also after the session the uh, game, the soccer game, we will watch uh, at 9 o'clock, uh, we'll live stream it. Uh, so we will try to finish everything uh, at uh, 8.30 and then we have a guest uh, all the way from Shanghai, he came. Uh, and uh, also a very interesting uh, project and company, he will quickly also introduce uh, himself uh, to you and uh, uh, t tell us uh, a little more about uh, his uh, ventures and his activities. Uh, and then you can network until the soccer game. You can stay here, we watch it, but if you have other commitments, please feel free also to meet your friends outside. So, um, we will uh, try to keep it uh, you know, quite short and come to the point, and then you can do the Q&A, wrap it up, network, be happy, and then celebrate, uh, ho uh, hopefully, Germany's uh, entry to the uh, finals uh, in the uh, championship. Okay, now, um, Max. 
Jens. Jens, äh, ein Applaus. Ja, maybe some of you uh, remember, we had uh, Michael Hübel here uh, and he said, where is the Eye of the Tiger? So we had no time to arrange it. I didn't want it, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't sort of Jens, avoid it. No, Jens <laughs> asked, where is Eye of the Tiger? And I said, now we have the time, we find it on YouTube. And uh, that was Eye of the Tiger, he is our champion. Thank you very much, uh, Jens, for being with us, despite sure. the hot weather and despite the soccer game and uh, 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 all the emotions uh, and sharing your time with us. Um, I told our crowd audience, uh, you know, some brief information about uh, you, but before coming to uh, Kenneth Partners and your activities, maybe some profane questions like, I see you have an iWatch, do you use interesting apps on your smartphone um, or the watch. on your watch the watch is your <laughs> no I, I, I use the the watch and I use the circles to try and get some exercise that's pretty much it okay but no other fancy no, no not really so not you really. go shopping offline I shop offline I do my banking <laughs> offline you do your banking yeah. offline yeah. okay so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alternative, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, so some fintech companies so need some, new some customers. Some, sometimes I use the uh, the machine at the bank, so it's, it's <laughs> like ha halfway halfway digital. Okay, yeah, I interesting to hear that from someone who is a technology enthusiast. But uh, yeah, that's another perspective. But we will uh, uh, um, learn from you uh, in a while. But Twitter, you have a Twitter account. I have a Twitter account. Yeah, we have a Twitter account too. <laughs> and we have a hashtag, which is hashtag SGF6. And we have a tweet wall here behind you. The first time we're also experiencing new technology. So we're trying to learn new technology. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Andreas, we managed to have also live stream and all these uh, nice goodies here at YouTube. Um, Jens, um, You are, this is like a double premiere, we said it on Facebook, we are doing it in English, the entire uh, event for the first time, because we have international audience, not only from Shanghai, but also, for example, Ram, uh, now also a Frankfurter, but from Tel Aviv, uh, and uh, uh, other people, so we um, thought we also, you know, address the international audience, and second uh, premiere is, we never had an investor here, uh, so we need money. Basically. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you for having you here. Uh, uh, so and you can all line up afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need money, so that's the reason why you invited you uh, to here. But no, uh, maybe you tell us something about uh, uh, Kenneth Partners. What sure. is Kenneth Partners, and what does Kenneth Partners do? Sure. Well, maybe maybe before we we get into that, you know, thank you for uh, for the invitation. And an even bigger thank you for, uh, for a full house, uh, e even on a day like this. I'll do my best, although it'll be difficult to say something intelligent and coherent. Um, but maybe, maybe we're lucky. So, so yeah, Kenneth, Kenneth Partners is, um, is, is a growth equity fund um, investing uh, in technology. And I'll get back to what the, the difference is in, 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 in a bit. So we will invest in... Um, in more mature companies. So we're not a, a typical VC. We will invest sort of as of three to four million euros in, in, in revenues. And uh, it doesn't have to be profitable, but we need to f sort of like see there's a track to, to, to profitability. And, uh, you know, I think we're one of the only investors um, that has uh, both teams in Silicon Valley and in London. And I and a, and a, and a, and a colleague are, are actually based here in, um, here in, here in Frankfurt. We have about 700 million uh, under management and about 15 people uh, on, on, on the team. And uh, we primarily look at, uh, at software deals and we do consumer and enterprise. But uh, right now we're probably 70% enterprise and 30% uh, consumer uh, um, is, is, is just about where, uh, where we are. So I think if, if, if you kind of look at what, what really differentiates us Uh, from, from a VC is clearly that we'll invest at a later stage. But we're also more attuned to capital efficiency uh, because we, we strongly believe that one of the biggest contributors to return is not the amount of capital that you can raise, 
it actually has an inverse uh, uh, relationship to to sort of like the the level of success you can achieve. So I think you, the more you can achieve with less capital, the better everybody everybody are are off. So so that's essentially sort of, of our our focus, if you will, our view of the world. Yeah. And in that sense, I mean, you said what what differentiates us from VCs? Uh, of course, you said the later stage investments also in terms of let's say services or your unique selling point is it that you have uh, also that you just give invest money or w in what areas would you support also these companies which are matured companies so they're not early stage probably they know how to you know manage their companies but is there anything you can do for them besides yeah. giving money no I, I, absolutely so what, what we try to do mo most companies that we invest in in Europe will want to go to the US most companies we invest in in, in, in the US will want to go to Europe so we, uh, we we try to help them best best as we can with internationalization strategies team build outs and, and and so forth but I think you've rightfully said that the the interactions that you have with a with a very young company are different from the ones that you have with a much more mature company just because management is more mature and and so forth uh, so so th i think the number and the level of engagement is, is somewhat uh, somewhat different to uh, mm. to an early stage uh, company yeah. but still also like you know grown ups need support no ab absolutely absolutely yeah. and i mean you know one of one of the things we can add is that we see quite a lot of stuff you know so we've seen a lot of things many times I think we can we can probably avert, you know, spending money on a direction because we've seen a couple of times that it probably won't won't work. Mm. Okay. And, you know, and I think uh, so. Like the, the the team, it's a good mix of of financial guys, but also ex founders. So I think we add value in not only being financial people, um, but also having people on the team that have built companies and you know created exits and, and so forth uh, as, as a founder uh, as an operator if you will. Mm. What is uh, always interesting for us here is uh, of course to understand the current activities of our guests what they do and uh, you know but it's also interesting to understand uh, the path to today so uh, Jens today and Jens like uh, a few years ago now, um, when I go back, uh, when I started uh, buying stocks, it was when I was a civil servant. I, I, I remember my first uh, and my second investment. The first investment I made, I think, 300 uh, mark, and uh, uh, the day after I lost it. Uh, uh, so uh, the enthusiasm and uh, it was it did not last long until uh, you know I, I started again. Uh, that was new market. So I remember the new market even. Uh, though I am not, you know, very, very old uh, and uh, you're not very old too, but both we remember there were these days of the new market. Now coming to my uh, situa uh, question, do you remember your first investment? What, what was it? What, what is it? Was it a stock or was it company? Yeah, no, I, I, it? I remember really well. So it was in 1992 and I founded my own company and invested the, the little money I had. So I went to the bank, got a little bit of money, invested a little bit of my own, and I had the, uh, the nice sum of 7,500 euros to, uh, to start my company with. And uh, so that kind of resulted in four years, and I'm sure that those of you who are founders will, will know about this, but it was like four years of, on the first of the month, not knowing when to pay salary, how to pay salaries at, at the end of, of the month. I don't think that has changed much, even though there's more venture capital around. You know, I, I think it's still a still a struggle. Mm -hmm. So I, I, there's not a lot of room for wannabes, I think, because it is tough to uh, to, to to build a company. So um, I, I, I built my company um, uh, over four years, sold it to an American company, and and I think here's a here's a learning, is that uh, I had this guy come over from the U.S. and he made a pretty good impression. And uh, the company was called Showcase Corporation. I was probably taken in with the corporation bit. Um, and so we negotiated the sale of my company, which was an all-stock deal, so there was, there was no cash. And the next time I went over to see them in the U.S. was in, uh, in, uh, in, in Rochester, Minnesota. I came in, there were like two rooms and 20 people. Right? I, I thought that huge company and, and so forth. So here, here's the learning, you know, do at, le at least superficial due diligence before you sell uh, before you sell your company. <laughs> 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 and, and know your partner. 
yeah but but it ended up r really really well so but but the struggling kept going because they were struggling yeah. just as as I was but we, we ended up uh, we ended up uh, raising uh, two, two and a half million um, uh, dollars which at the time you know we looked at our account statement and was sort of like trying to figure out how to invest it uh, you know we learned quickly though um, yeah. and uh, you know it went on we've had an, an ASDAQ IPO and sold it later to SPSS for 120 okay. million so it, was, it, it ended up pretty good. When, when did you have this initial idea to, to found that company? So do you I, remember I, that? Yeah n absolutely and I, and I think this is another important aspect of founding because it's on vogue to found companies uh, uh, nowadays I think there's two ways of, of doing it. Well, there's many ways of doing it, but I think there's two main ways. One is, you know, you, you're working and, and you see a problem and you know that you can solve it with technology. So you have domain expertise, at least you should have, because you're working in that area right now. It could be in a bank, so you, you, you do a fintech kind of, kind of company to, s to solve a problem. And then there's the other way of founding is to research all of the stuff that hasn't been done yet and let's do that. You know, both can work absolutely, but I think, I think sort of like the the higher probability of success is probably the the first one. And I don't want to discourage anybody, of of course, from from doing the second one. Not 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 at all. And um, so I, I lived in a small town with seven thousand people, and IBM had built a huge education center uh, in that small town. So it was a huge hotel where they then sent all of their people and clients to 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 education. And down in the basement, they had every piece of IBM hardware. So AS400, System 36s, 4300s, RT6000s. There was just everything down there. And um, I actually got a job to set up all of the workstations with DOS 3.1 and, and, and stuff like that. So I had the key. So I, I sat down there and learned myself to code RPG 400 and stuff like that. And I actually saw that there was a problem in that the, w the way that it worked in those days and partly even today is that if you needed information out of big IBM machines, you know, somebody would print a big thick report out mm -hmm. and give it to a, a bunch of people and they would key it into Lotus 1, 2, 3, which was the, and that's like error prone and stuff like that. So I built a small software pro program that could allow you to be in cell C3 and say I want this data directly into into the cell that was kind of the without people typing without everything. people typing it in yeah mm. so that was that was the, the kick of kind of artificial intelligence type <laughs> of uh, I'll, I'll tell you what <laughs> I'll tell you what there's no artificial intelligence in there but today we would have probably said artificial yeah. intelligence <laughs> <laughs> because I think everything is artificial intelligence nowadays yeah yeah. But it started, I think, with the text recognition. I mean, now uh, Google, I think, uh, bought uh, uh, recently a company which is object recognizing objects. So it was the OCR scans. I remember I had also this, uh, you know, small like a mouse to scan, where you needed like uh, 20 minutes to scan one page uh, and uh, click in the internet, wait like another 20 minutes uh, until you enter the internet. So that was artificial intelligence that days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So how, how many are, are founders in here? Don't be quite, shy. Quite a few. Quite a few. Mm. Cool. Founders and accelerators, actually. I mean, not only founding themselves, but also supporting. Uh, and yeah, many, many uh, founders, uh, w which is great, because I think it makes no sense just, you know, sitting together, having uh, not the audience, the right audience. So we're very glad that we have a very diverse uh, backgrounds, interesting people. They're probably, they're probably only half listening because they're worried about the two technicians that are threatening to, to quit, you know, paying salaries next month. And, you probably, know, yeah. Two but clients that aren't happy and stuff. So Yeah, but they, here maybe they find other people they can hire or exchange yeah, or yeah, whatever, absolutely. yeah. Um, what do you like most about investing in companies? I mean, investing could be, as you said, you can you know buy stocks, or you can do commodity trading or other stuff. That's mm -hmm. also investing. But what 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 do you like especially about investing in in companies directly or yeah? I, I think the development of it. So I've I've been involved either as a founder or as an early employee in five tech companies uh, throughout eleven years until two thousand four when I changed sort of to the dark side, if, if, if you will. And um, 
so, so back in the day, it was it was the question: Do you do a six, you know, or do you do you do something that's tech oriented but with a with a steeper learning curve? And I actually think it's it's great that you can work with three or four companies at the same time, and not get into the nitty gritty of it, but but still be involved and, and try to, to to bring it forward. So I think, you know, you have sort of like three distinct events, although one of them isn't an event. You have an entry and an exit, and then there's everything in between. And I think the stuff in between where you can sort of help companies and at least try not to get in the way um, is, 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 is an interesting, interesting aspect uh, of, of investing. And try, obviously, not to make sort of like the wrong investments. True. I mean, that's also, do you have times where your heartbeat, uh, you know, increases because you think it's getting tricky and maybe the investment was not the best idea what happens then yeah almost every day <laughs> you know, our life isn't isn't much different from 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 the founder because you know if you have a portfolio of companies and i think every company you know we we look at TechCrunch and we see all of these articles about uber and you know uber of pets and uber of of stuff and we think it's it's great but uh, but every company is is ups and downs. I think if over like three or five years that you have a curve that goes up, it's fine. But if you zoom in on any particular time of that curve, you have uh, ups and downs. And and clearly you you get you know it's a lot of money that's invested, and and clearly you start to get heartbeat, and you try and and, and get out of various situations mm -hmm. because cash out is something you should try to avoid. Yeah, but you're also in a like. A, mentoring role like if i'm a founder and i get stressed because people are leaving or the the you know system does not work as i thought or the customers are not coming i get nervous and i would call you and say you know the investment in my company help us out because something doesn't work uh, right then you need to stay calm probably and say you know we we can s sort this out right yeah i think most uh most founders work differently quite frankly because, and, and that's also the right way it should work. Most founders are strong guys or, 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 or girls, and uh, they think they can get out of it. So I think when we do get a call, it's kind of it's kind of really, really too late. late. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's too late. So I think essentially you work with, I suppose there's two ways, you know, you have the formal bit of working with a company, which is sort of like board meetings and, and so forth. But there's the informal part where you try to build up relationships where people respect each other so that there's a, a, a free flow of, of, of information mm. um, so you catch some of these things very very early on I mean you see probably many many startups so when you look at your startups which you know potential do you try to see or are you looking for both like people's wise sales product do you have a like gut feeling also when you see okay that could be you know that the next big uh, shot or is it very technical that you do the due diligence so where is the gut feeling and where is the uh, uh, analytical part right. so so clearly there's a there's there's a gut feeling in, involved but i think the gut feeling comes at at the beginning and i think one of one of the things you have to be extremely careful about is uh if you work with a company that you want to try to invest in over an extended amount of time, you have uh, the, the, the danger of falling in love with, with a company, right? So essentially, you, you try to justify positively whatever you see in, in, in a company. And I think you need to somehow have some, some distance to, to the company and try and avoid that. And I think every investor has had that happen uh, uh, to him. Um, so the, the, the phase that we invest in is much more... Um, it, it's much less gut driven than if you have a very early stage because it's like, you know, you, you can always almost say, you know, how do you how do you look at this? So you look at the team and the market and the growth of the market. That's pretty much that's pretty much it. Mm. We have a lot more information because we're like five years further down uh, the road or three or whatever uh, what, whatever it is. So we look quite uh, quite intensely at historical, so like mm -hmm. financials and growth and EBITDA and, and so mm -hmm. forth. But we also do all of the market research and try and mm -hmm. figure out, can the company grow? Does the company need additions in the team? Can it go to the US? Should it go to the US? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. 
so we are we we are slightly more I would have thought technical in how we, mm. we look at these um, at, at these companies. Mm. But still, I can imagine also in the later stage. I mean, there could be also the danger of fatigue or tiredness or lack of innovation, as we see in many corporates. So for many years they're uh, doing quite well, and mm. then suddenly something happens in the system, and you know, no innovation. Do you see that also in companies? They grow until a tipping point and then they just go down? Yeah, it, it happens. You know, every company has a, has a life cycle. Yeah. Um, and, and the team kind of decides how that life cycle get, it gets extended with new developments, new products, maybe acquisitions and, and, and so forth. So we see that quite, uh, we see that quite, quite frequently. Mm. And then, it, you know, the, the question becomes, if something has stalled, is it because of the team? Um, is it because the founder is, is has sort of like come to his ability, um, or is it the market is the product or, or something like that? I, I think if if you can fix it, if there's a couple of bucks and you think you can fix it, then it's probably an opportunity because it's going to be less expensive mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of entry. Um, but it's clearly one of those where you need to be extremely careful. Once growth has, has flattened, it, it becomes a, a bit of a gamble, quite, quite frankly. Mm. Um, but yes, we, we, see that, uh, we see that quite, quite okay. frequently. And it's, you know, I, I suppose there's always this big discussion, you know, at, 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 certainly in the U.S., about the founder and the founding team. You know, just, it used to be sort of like maybe 10 years ago, VCs in the U.S., they would typically just replace the CEO because he would be, for a decree, not a good guy because he founded the company. And I think sort of like, uh, and recent Horowitz and others have sort of like now looked at, well, maybe the founder just needs some hand holding. Maybe he needs to be guided and mentored to, mm -hmm. to, to. And, and the, the thing about the founder is that if he's sort of like envisaged what the company is, the product and so forth, it becomes ex extremely dangerous to kick him out. Of, mm. of it just because with him the vision disappears and if you just have hired guns in the company so like developing it further with with vision not only sort of like 20 percent growth a year and so forth becomes extremely difficult mm. so it is a it, it is very difficult and the founder usually keeps playing a very very uh, a substantial role yeah yeah but that was, uh, I, I, I told you earlier, uh, I was like a, a few week, weeks ago in, in London at our Startup Grind, uh, Grind Europe conference. Uh, for the first time in my life, I met uh, Eric Schmidt. I mean, he wrote books and every everyone uh, knows uh, him. And he told us that was interesting. Probably most of you know the story, the anecdote. But when he first started with Google, like he, well, he had the CEO background and was with Xerox and IBM. And then Larry Page and the, the, uh, the other founder of Google, they, they, they met there. And that was also what he said. He saw you have brilliant two founders with a great idea. But they, of course, uh, lack some skills. They never like manage a big company. They don't know, you know, how to sure. do effective marketing, etc. So, do you see that also often in these companies that they uh, are brilliant uh, uh, founders with great ideas, but they have sometimes difficulties uh, with managing people, managing growth, managing their marketing activities? Uh, no, absolutely. I think that's often often <coughs> the case. Uh, it's not always the case. You know, you have. Zuckerberg and Gates are the big examples, and clearly, in, on a smaller scale, you have the same in, in in every country. So we see that quite a quite a bit. And I think Google's solved it, you know, perfectly. They hired a, a, a businessman in, and he kind of showed the two guys how to do it. And now they're sort of like back uh, running their own company. Hmm. Don't know if you know this, by the way, but um, they were offered a half a million for the company, uh, sort of like at, at the beginning. They, th they, th they thought there was too little, so uh, they said they wanted 700,000, and the guy <laughs> said, no, that's too much. <laughs> so so, so I, I thought that was an interesting, ang I just heard it the other day, by yeah. the way, so I thought that was an interesting anecdote. Lovely. Whether or not it's true, who knows, yeah. at least. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, but it was very great when I when I saw Eric Schmidt, a very, you know, uh, 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 down-to-earth guy. I mean, he sits there, and he's like, you know, chairman of the biggest company in the world, but still, you know, very interesting, lo lovely, and and uh, um, how, how do you say, yeah, approachable, approachable person. I, I like that very much. Um, maybe you can before we come uh, also to our uh, ecosystem here, and uh, you know, uh, the buzzwords like fintech, Brexit, uh, etc. 
uh, maybe you can shed uh, some light also on this investment process like you know this hard facts there is a startup you call them and say i like your idea and they say yeah why not uh, we had already series a and series b we are a late stage company let's discuss let's sit uh, at the table uh, can you maybe you know describe how this process of whole evaluation uh, sitting down with these people negotiating contract terms shares minority shares employees who have uh, options like a big universe mm -hmm. how do you handle this process sure sure so uh, m maybe an initial comment I, I don't think that so, so right now there's a little bit of a drive that we absolutely have to raise money you know because raising VC is uh, is a sign of success um, because now I've raised five million from XYZ so I must be successful but it's not you know I, I think success is when you have operational success you know you win customers you generate revenue profits and and, and, and so forth maybe success is when you return when you return money to your investors and to yourself through an exit maybe an IPO or whatever but raising capital and 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 also through sort of like TechCrunch and and so forth that has almost become a goal in in itself to to raise capital so so I would say that if you don't absolutely need it, wait. You know, at, at, at Showcase back in the day, we waited several years and we got a good price for it. So we got a lot less dilution. And still we had an IPO and a sale. So, so you know, it's, people say, well, we need to be quick. Yes, you need to be quick, but you don't have to sort of like risk your company to, to, to be quick. So I'd be careful about that. About, and, and, and the other thing I, I see almost all the time is that a founder team gets together, they spend weeks, maybe months, on strategy. So they, they strategize about product, about go-to-market, they, they strategize about everything. And then, so like when they've strategized everything, they say, ah, we need some money, let's call them VCs, <laughs> right? So, so all of a sudden, VC becomes an absolute sort of tactical thing. And, and quite frankly, so like capital formation is probably the most important strategy that you can have because it, it, it you know, if, if you're very successful, it means that you get less money in an exit. But what it can also mean is that you make your, your company unfundable in the seed round or, or, or in an angel round further down the road. So, so I, I think you need to sort of look at funding as, as a strategy just as you would go to market and product and, and, and so forth. And um, and I think um, I think essentially that the, the strategy is to work your way backwards. So you need 12 to 18 months worth of runway, if possible. Uh, I know in Germany it's it's more difficult than it is in, in, in some other places. You work your way backwards and then try to figure out, you know, how much equity do I want to give up? And I, I think a r rule of thumb is that if you get to an A round and you have a, a professional investor that will invest in an A round, um, you know, they'll need 25 to 30%, and you still need to have a substantial amount of the company, otherwise people will not invest. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, like a, a very long cap table, it's, it's a big issue, because you know, if you have 30 people invested in the company, everybody has invested 10,000 here, 5,000 there, it becomes almost impossible to get you know, professional investor uh, into the company. So be careful about cap table, valuation, and, 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 st and stuff like that. Um, so that, that happens quite a, quite a lot. And um, I, I don't know if, if, if that's kind of like the direction you were, you, you were, you were looking yeah, for. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, okay. I, I, that's, that's probably sort of like the... Pro pro yeah, I, I think probably the audience will have also yeah m more uh, questions because I think they they are probably some of them have these questions in mind, be it in early stage or mid stage. So we can maybe, maybe yeah. we can talk a little bit about the about the players because there's a lot mm -hmm. of talk about. So how do I do it? You know, do I call up a VC or do I need a, an intro? And you know, some mm -hmm. some VCs will only talk to you if, if you're intro. Some will talk to you independently of, of of what. I think independently of whether or not they want to talk to you. If you come in as a as a recommendation from someone, clearly you have a you have a you have a leg up. So 
you know, the, the way that I would go about it is if, if you don't have that network and, and most founders don't when they, when they start out, I would sort of like look at who would potentially found my company because, you know, you talk to a VC that would found, say, if you have a SaaS company, then you'd call, talk to, to companies that found SaaS companies. If you're a marketplace, a digital marketplace, you'll talk to the people that will found uh, fund digital marketplaces. And essentially what I would do is that I would look at all of the portfolios of those companies and I would get in touch with the CEOs of those companies and, and just, you know, chat, shoot the breeze because they're much more accessible than, than the VCs are. And essentially through those I will then would then get introductions to to the actual to the actual VCs um, uh, going forward. Okay, cool. Maybe we, we do it topic shift and come uh, to, to some trends, uh, I mean the investment part, I'm sure there will be more uh, questions from the audience, coming to uh, like Frankfurt uh, and seeing uh, some trends both locally and globally as you know there is a lot of uh, activity in the fintech market the new fintech center, Habemus fintech center uh, finally and now there is one uh, in the Pollux center, there is not only one but also the Deutsche Börse has uh, its own system we have uh, some also successful fintech companies uh, there there is growing interest also from uh, politicians uh, interestingly because they want to uh, market that for frankfurt where do you see uh, the next years uh, is fintech really fin and tech or is it sometimes you know little fin and little very tech? little fin and very I'm, little i'm tech. quoting you yes, yeah, remember no, our lunch yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, I, so I think, to, to me, fintech is just like every other startup. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of regulation and stuff like that around it. But in the end, it's, it's right now hyped a little bit. You know, right or wrong, I don't, I don't know. But startups as a whole is, is, is hyped. And I think, you know, if you look at the fintechs, 50% of the fintechs that are founded today will die. You know, 25% will be zombies. And another 25% will... So, sort of like living debts, if you will. They'll do okay, they can sustain themselves, but they won't return any significant money. And then the last 25% is going to range from good to like really, really, really good. Um, so I, I don't think there's any difference in terms of is it, is it FinTech, is it SaaS, is, is, it, is it whatever, you know, from, from, from that perspective. I do think, however, that the banks have set themselves up for quite a, quite a catastrophe uh, because essentially they've... They've had decades of time where they've sort of like amalgamated and bundled various services and products with, with the sole purpose probably of removing every thread of transparency so they can charge you know, more than they should probably be charging for their, uh, for their services. So unbundling that, if, if you will, I, I think is a, is a big opportunity. Um, I, I do think, however, that if you want to unbundle banking products, you have to have more than a nicely designed credit card and a nicely designed um, app, you know, credit card put in a nicely designed box uh, and, and send out. I think you, you, need, you need tech. You, you need to, to somehow have more around it because the bank can also hire a design firm to design those things. And who has the most money to spend, you know, to sort of like, who, who can last longer, the startup or the bank? Well, you know, the, the, the bank probably can. So, I think the banks are facing some difficult times. I think it will be a little bit like probably the music industry. Uh, you know, you see the, the big players in the music industry are still around. They're just sort of like restructured and different. And I don't think we're going to have a post-banking era. I think the banks are going to stay there, but they'll be somewhat different. And there'll be fintechs that are doing various bits and pieces of, of the value chain, mm. which I think is, is fine. Mm. Do you think, but sometimes when you say like 50% of the fintechs will not survive, uh, do you think some founders are, uh, let's put it at, uh, pro uh, provocatively, also naive because they see there is a trend and they do some app here, some app there, and they have maybe no experience in financial uh, you know, uh, systems, whatever procedures, and then they start, they, they think we can do it and then they, they fail? No, I, I think absolutely. Uh, there's a level of some, clearly none, none in this room, um, that are slightly naive um, in, in terms of starting it. But it, it, it doesn't matter, right? Because if you're a young guy, why not, why not try it? 
And uh, if you fail, I mean, it's not really that bad. It used to be bad in Germany, but even in Germany, it's kind of okay to, 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 to fail. Mm. So I think, I think if you do have the idea, even, even though you're not as committed, you know, I, I would say just go ahead and try it because nothing really, really bad happens. Right? Mm. So uh, it doesn't hurt. It, it it doesn't really hurt. Yeah, I but think you, you should need not to be die. You should be able you shouldn't, to. You shouldn't die, stand up. And, and you should be aware that if you do raise money, you're dealing with other people's money, and yeah. and and sort of like be be upfront about sort of like your business and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and maybe some, you know, ideas on, on, on the Brexit. Everyone is uh, talking about Brexit. I think when we met for lunch, it was like two or uh, three days ago when Brexit happened. How do you see the Brexit for Frankfurt? Uh, people think we could be the winner. Uh, and also for startups and fintechs, it could be an interesting time. And uh, now with the uh, stock exchange, London Stock Exchange and the uh, Deutsche Börse, the, the, the merger could be in danger or... There is also rumors and discussions, etc. Where do you see the Brexit for fintech startups? So I, I suppose there's two, two levels uh, to, to look at the Brexit. One is sort of like macro, you know, what, what does it really mean? And right now, clearly the insecurity is causing a lot of, you know, effects and the pound is like at the lowest it's been, you know, forever. I think the FTSE is back up, even above what it was, you know, pre-Brexit. But there's a lot of disruption. You know, I just read, um, I just read the other day that there's there's somebody that measures the the number of online adverts, job adverts in the UK, and apparently that's gone down now with 700,000 job adverts less, you know, than at the same time last year. So clearly, it's going to have an impact. I just don't think it's going to have any impact on on the fintechs in London or the fintechs here, quite frankly, because I think if you go down to that level, you know, capital finds good companies and it doesn't matter where they are. And if, if, if you have a good fintech company in London, it'll get funded. If you have a good fintech in company in Frankfurt, it'll, it'll get funded. Mm. Um, I think there's an opportunity in, in another area because if they don't get the free movement of people solved somehow, it's going to be very difficult for, for UK-based startups to, to get people. Um, and and that, could be, that could be an ad, ad, you know, advantage that people will come to Frankfurt or Berlin or, or, or wherever they would, uh, they would come to. So I think at, at, at that level, there, there's an opportunity. But quite frankly, I mean, you know, how, how, how do you want to, you know, if, if you're Angela Merkel, how, how do you want to explain to Daimler and BMW and, and stuff like that that you don't want to give them access to the free market? I, I mean, I don't know how, how, that, yeah. how that works. So that they'll find a solution, yeah. I'm sure, and, and it's not going to have too much of an impact. Good, I'm relaxed. I think though that mm -hmm. the banks are probably going to the banks are probably going to pull off quite a lot of people from from the London city. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, and uh, also the rents uh, will go up. So if you want to buy a house, it's maybe a good time to buy one. Fi final questions be uh, before we come to the Q and A. Now you are investor. You have you know huge money. You can. Uh, by big ticket investments but here like when you can't put our you know little money on savings accounts because there is no interest uh, how can i can a private person without making like anlage empfehlung here or uh, investment uh, suggestions how can i put like my little money in startups and try to also you know uh, leverage uh, this uh, should i put it in rocket internet uh, shares or you know uh, 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 other other uh, startups you don't have to answer that but i mean you have in in, in the us you have uh, the y combinators 500 startups like funding circles where people can apply etc and invest on platforms equity how can i put equity in this interesting startup market as a private person in germany would you even want to yes i mean Startups is, is is highly, highly, highly risky. I mean, it's like really, really risky. It's like gambling. It, it is uh, it, it, probably even worse. <laughs> than, <laughs> I think going to Vegas is probably uh, a, a better bet on, yeah. on, on winning some winning some money. Let's go so, to so, Vegas. So, so, so he, he, here's the thing. You know, clearly you can invest sort of like on, on crowdfunding uh, uh, platforms. And a lot of people do, and, and, and I think it's great that there's a whole bunch of different ways of, of, of raising funding. But what if, if, if you're a company, 
there's some adverse selection in, involved in it. What, what, what if you're a company, so Sequoia wants to invest f five million, mm -hmm. or you can take it from the crowd on a crowdfunding platform? Which are you going to take? Sequoia, right? So I'm, I'm not saying that, that everybody is like that, but there's a large proportion of the crowdfunding companies that have not been able to raise money from professional investors. And then there's a bit of adverse selection in that. I'm, I'm not saying that everybody is like that, but there's quite a bit of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think crowdfunding works if, if, if it becomes part of your marketing mix. So if you have a consumer product and you put it onto Kickstarter, you know, then you know clearly you can generate quite a lot of of uh, of uh, like you know sexiness around around your product, and you you have people buying it at half the price, and it it, it becomes really nice. But as a as a as a major funding mechanism, I'm I'm skeptical. Uh, it's still early days, so it could change. But but mm -hmm. right now, I'm I'm fairly skeptical. I would I would put I would put my money onto a uh, a savings account with 0.1 percent interest rate because that's going to be better than putting it into startups. I'm and afraid. blowing everything. Unless, of course, you have an own startup. Mm -hmm. That is uh, that's a different one because you should believe in that like very strongly and, and invest some money and put all your money yeah. in your own startup. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> if the startup dies, you die too. Then you die too. Yeah. Well, it was a wonderful conversation, uh, very short uh, for me, I felt it, uh, although we've uh, talked uh, more than 30 minutes, I think because it's getting interesting now and you have, you know, uh, we, we touched upon uh, various topics, I think the floor is yours. Oh, so many questions, lovely. Wonderful, perfect. I, I, I see that you, you know, you're eager to talk more and people are eager to ask more questions. That's a perfect sign. I think we had a great time with great insights. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. That, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Uh, it's not over yet. Huh? I mean, you have the networking part until uh, the match starts. Uh, I mean, anyone who needs to leave now because he or she wants to meet friends or whatever outside to do the soccer game, they can do it in two minutes. Uh, others can stay here with us uh, and watch, uh, watch the uh, soccer game. I need to say a, a big, big thank you to uh, you know, many people involved. Let me do that part, which is the... Uh, most exciting part of our event is thanking our sponsors, PwC Strategy End, for uh, sponsoring our event. Of course, Gründermaschine, Max, thank you, and uh, Stefan, uh, I don't know if he's still here. Many, many thanks, and uh, also Adrian, uh, who should be here in the room. Uh, and then uh, our also media partners like Venture Capital Magazine für Gründer.de, Gründerszene und T3N and the wonderful uh, team of Startup uh, Grind, like doing all this backstage uh, work, Andreas, uh, JP, Taiba, Susanne, Mung, Arina, Julia, Max, Hans uh, and Alex. I hope I did not forget anyone. Uh, 